Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lone Vic, and today, one of those moments I've been waiting for for a very long time because it's a game landing on my table that I've been impatiently waiting for for a long time. Frostbug, the board game, as you can see the Polish edition on my table, but in this video I will be talking about how to set up and play this game based on the scenario discussed in the rulebook. I will be using, do not be afraid, all the English nomenclature from the English version of the rulebook, so the video is easily understandable, but if you don't know Polish, then at least there will be no spoilers for you when it comes to the cards that I might be showing during the video, so well, there's an upside always. If you like my video, if you would like to support the channel and what I'm doing here, Lone Vic, like, subscribe, ring the notification bell to be notified about new videos on my channel. In the description to the video, there is a link if you would like to buy me a cup of coffee as well. And right now we will take a look at how to set this game up and then I will try to explain to you in the clearest possible way and how I understood it and how I'm playing it, what are the rules for playing Frostpunk, the cooperative survival board game. Okay guys, so as you can see, I thought I have a big table, but Frostpunk is a table hog and I'm struggling to have all the boards and all the elements on the table and in the viewport, as you can see, here are my hands at the same time. So pardon me for the perspective, pardon me for any edges that might be cut, but nothing important right now is out of the viewport. So let's talk about the setup of the game right now. So first things first, what we have on the table currently is the generator tile on which we'll be placing the huge generator tower. And we also have a lot of other boards. There is the building board over here, the supply board is over here, we already have the expedition cards and we'll be going through those as well. Over there in the corner there is the dusk board, we've got the population board in the middle, we've got the round and morning board over there and lower below it we've got the hope and discontent board and this here to the side over here is the generator board. A lot of boards and each of them managing a different part of the game. Let me mention that I'm setting this game up for the scenario that's discussed in the rulebook, which is called a new home crater. If you are setting up a different scenario, the shape of the map might be different, the rules for the scenario might be different, but all of the boards will be needed anyways. So, Take a look at the scenario book, choose whichever scenario you want. This is the one that the rulebook suggests to start with. So here we go. So first the generator tile should be placed and oriented in this way exactly as is right now. And the edges of the board, so this hexagonal six, should be put together out of those six puzzle pieces showing this cliff face surrounding the generator. The next thing is the generator itself. Together with the drawer, place it over here in the middle of the table. Doesn't it look impressive? Do not use this expansion element yet. This is an upgrade for the generator which will be used with a technology card. You can put this back into the box. Take the cook house tile, as you can see, this orange one, and place it on the space above the generator. So I don't know if you'll be seeing it in the video, but it's right there, over there behind the generator. Now, the two tiles on the sides of the generator show that there should be resources placed there. So take five wood and place this wood on this side of the generator and five coal on this side of the generator respectively. Next, take the starting wall tiles and place them face down and choose any corner of the rim board that you've constructed and place one starting wall tile at random face up on the chosen corner. And as soon as you see three starting wall tiles depicting resources, so I've got one, two, and the third one is over there in that corner, fill in the rest with empty 
starting tiles and the rest goes back into the box. So those deposits are depicting either coal or wood in that corner over there. The map tiles should be separated into two stacks based on their backs and shuffle each stack separately, place them somewhere nearby on the table because you'll be taking from those stacks quite often and first take the R stack with this symbol of the crater border and place one hex in each corner of the board where there is no wood or coal tile, like so. Then take a near stack of tiles and place one in between the generator and the newly added far tiles also face up. This not only starts your map, it also helps you position the generator tile in the very middle of the crater and the orientation of those tiles doesn't have to be facing the same way, but it helps with the readability of the map. The last thing is that you need to place resources on those tiles according to what is shown on them. So for example, you've got trees, wood, we've got some coal in some places, and sometimes even we have nothing. So let me just populate the terrain very quickly. And here we are. So as you can see, we've got some forests here and in the north, we've got a lot of coal, we've got some wood, and we've got even two steam cores on the tiles right now. Now, all the other supplies, such as wood, coal, steam cores, trees, citizen meeples, automatons, which are not currently being used on the board, are placed somewhere nearby with easy access. They are known as the bank, but I won't be doing that right now because the real estate on the table is very, very limited. Now, let's talk about the expeditions. If your scenario mentions this, you should remove any expedition cards that do not take part in the scenario, but for this scenario, all expedition cards are used. You separate the stacks A, B and C. As you can see in the top left corner, there is a letter there. You place those stacks near the board with the expedition, this white side facing up, and you take the three top cards from the A deck and you place them along the edge of the map and those are the starts of each expedition track, like I did over here. So I have three starts of the expedition. Take the technology cards, which have this tech symbol on the reverse, remove any that are not used in the current scenario, but for the new home crater scenario, we use all of the cards apart from the Steam Hub. There you go, Steam Hub removed. Shuffle the remaining technology cards and select four at random, placing them face up along the edge of the map, and this is the technology display. Those are the technologies that will be available to you in the game. The rest of them go back into the box. Sorry that you can't see all of the cards here, but like I said, real estate is limited, but this will be not a problem when explaining. Place a development token on each of those technological cards with the black inactive side up. Now we're moving into the society card. The society cards, as you can see, apart from having this symbol on the reverse, have different levels of difficulty. There is society one with green normal and red difficult or hard level, society two with normal and hard, three, four, five, and six, all divided into two difficulty categories. For this scenario, the rulebook suggests society one on normal level of difficulty. So take this card and it will indicate a lot of information for the starting resources and everything that we'll be adding during the setup. So place it somewhere nearby so that you can access those information easily. I will place it over here for now. Now we will be looking at the population board, which is on the very top of the screen. We take a look at the society card and we place the markers for the populations of the citizens and the sickness levels on the respective tracks. So as you can see, I will have 22 workers, 12 engineers. I will also have eight children and none of them are sick. I will also have zero automatons to start with. As you can see, I have placed the green marker for kids on eight, the blue one for the engineers on 12 and the yellow one 
for the workers on 22 respectively and the sickness markers I've placed on zero because my card said that nobody is sick. And mind you that those sickness markers are double-sided and you should place them with the syringe side up. Take the food marker, which is the yellow marker with the fork and knife, and place it on the amount of food shown on the society card in the beginning of the game. The food track is the lowest track of the population board. So as you can see, my food level in the beginning of the game is eight. Take the hunger marker, which is a red marker with the fork and knife symbol, place it on the zero spot of the same track. Now, if you have any food symbols on your beginning tiles on the map, you would increase the yellow food marker respectively by those numbers. But alas, I do not have any on my board. Now let's talk about the supply board. The first thing you do is again take a look at the society card and see how many deaths you have in the beginning. This is this little skull icon with the house in the background. As you can see I've got one. So you place the marker for the death count on the first space of this death track on the supply board. Then you fill in the supply board with all the other resources you have. So in my case it's four wood and five coal and zero steam cores and I place them over here. And for each type of citizens I will populate this supply board with an amount shown above the track. So I don't know if you can see very well here but I will zoom in for an example. There we go. If my worker marker in the beginning was on the 22 position that means that I place five worker meeples on the supply board. And similarly, you have to check the track for engineers and children. And so, as you might have guessed, I've got three engineers, five workers and two children added over here. My society card showed that I have zero automatons, so I won't be adding any to my supply board right now. And those spent citizen tokens should be placed somewhere near the supply board for use when needed. Next, we're talking about the building board and here the case is very easy. You populate each space of the building board with a corresponding tile that matches the type of the building, like so. Note that not all buildings that are delivered with the game will be placed on this board. Some of them have an icon in the top right corner which will correspond to a certain law or maybe even a certain scenario in which those buildings will be used. So don't worry that there is no space for all of them. And I've placed only one for each stack just symbolically because I won't be using all of them anyways in this demonstration. Now the next board is the hope and discontent board which I have in my hand right now. You place all of the discontent tokens into the bag of discontent and mix them up and based on the information from your society card you draw in my case two tokens and place them from left to right and one of them will be active side up because I've got two as the first number so this is two that I draw and one is that the first one will be placed active side up and then you do the same for the hope tokens from the other bag and in this case I will draw two and two of them will be the active side up. So I will just populate this board right now and show you the effect. There we go. So as you can see I've got two tokens for discontent. One of them is facing the active side up and I've got two tokens for hope and both of them are facing up with the active side. Now we're getting close to the end and of the setup and this is the round and morning board and we place it somewhere near the hope and discontent board the rulebook suggests above and we place the round marker on the first space of this board and we place the storm marker on the space described by the scenario. In the case of this first scenario from the rulebook this is space 9. Additionally you shuffle the morning cards with the sun icon over here and place them on the space on the round and morning board. There we go. Take the deck of law cards with this scale symbol on the back. Separate cards 0, 1 to 0, 8 because those are the starting ones and place them face up in a pile in the future 
law display on the main board. So I will place them over there above the expedition cards. Now from the rest of the law cards, numbered 9 through 16, shuffle them, choose four of them at random and place them with the other eight law cards and the unused ones are returned to the box. This way we've got 12 laws in the stack over there. Take the 32 law consequence cards, which are marked with a moon on one side and are purple in color on the other side, and place them next to the law cards. And looking at the law cards that are available, take any buildings from the ones that you didn't use right now on the building board that correspond to the laws in your deck and place them below the board so that they are available during the game if the corresponding law is introduced. I won't be doing that right now, but you can see in the text of those laws that, for example, this one unlocks the care home, this one unlocks the fighting arena, and this one unlocks the pub. Some of them don't unlock anything or any buildings, so no buildings are related to them. Now, the dusk board in the upper right corner requires the inevitable dusk card, which has the number of triple zero and you place it face down in the middle space like so you shuffle the social dispute cards and place them face up in the rightmost space of that board like so and you should read through the top social dispute card so that you know what's coming up keep the rest of the dusk cards in the box until they are required the generator board is the last board that we will be talking about Take the heat marker and place it on the first space on the board with the unexploded side up. Take the three heat range markers and place them using the colors from red to orange to yellow, like so on the board. They can be placed only in one orientation like this. And place the cold marker on the fifth spot of the weather track. Take the deck of weather cards, remove any that are not required by the scenario. In the first scenario from the rulebook, all cards are required. Shuffle them and place them on the space on the generator board. Each player then chooses one advisor. If you are playing with less than four players, divide the advisors as equally as possible among the players. Take the citizen deck, remove any cards that are required to be removed by the scenario, shuffle the remaining cards and place them face down in a deck next to the map and hand out a number of cards to each player. In a four player game, each player gets four cards in a three-player game, five cards each, in a two-player game, six cards each, and in a solo game, the only player playing gets seven cards. Now, each player must choose and discard one of their cards that they've gotten in this way, placing it face up in the discard pile next to the citizen deck, and the player must pay the starting cost of this card, which is shown here in the top right corner. So for example, this card will mean that you need to spend one coal marker in order to discard this card. A card cannot be discarded if its starting cost cannot be paid, and if two players want to discard a citizen card of the same starting cost and this cost cannot be paid, one player has to choose a different card, obviously. For the first scenario called a new home crater, take the corresponding card from scenario 1, number 01, which will tell you to place two scenario trigger markers on round 4 and 11 of the round board, which I will do now. As you can see, both markers are already there, and place the card somewhere nearby, and also locate the storm card for the same scenario and place it nearby as well. The game also comes with responsibility sheets, which are larger sheets with instructions for separate elements of the game, which should be handed out to players so that they can familiarize themselves with specific elements of the game so that no one player has to remember everything. But for the explanations in this video, I will skip this element. And for now, we are done with setting up the game. And I think that this was the longest setup I have ever done, ladies and gentlemen.
Okay guys, so we're finally set up with the game. Now before we dive into the game turn and how the game flows, let's talk about very quickly why and how you can win or lose. Now the winning condition is very simple. You have to complete the goals of the scenario and those goals will be uncovered by you once you are reaching certain thresholds on the round track over there, those green markers that we've placed, and also fulfilling the conditions of the scenario that sometimes are described on the scenario cards like this one over here. There are, however, a lot of ways in which you can die or lose in Frostpunk. The first one is people lose their will to survive. This occurs when your last hope token is removed from the hope track. Remember the hope track is this green track of green tokens over here. So when you lose the last token with hope over there, you lost the game. People can also banish you from the city and this occurs when you place the sixth this content, so the red token over there on the track. Currently, we've got only two of those. And when that happens, you have been banished from the city, game is over. And this is regardless of whether those tokens are active or inactive, so white or black. Sixth token does the job. Explosion of the generator also ends the game. And this occurs when the generator breaks down for the second time, because when it breaks down for the first time, you flip this generator token from this flame side to the exploded side, and this marks that it has broken down once. And when this happens for the second time, the game is over. Overwhelming sickness is another condition that can end your game prematurely, and this occurs if any of the sickness markers on the population track, so those three with the syringes on the zero spot right now, are on space 26 or higher, on the population track during the preparation phase. So you have a whole game turn until the next preparation phase to lower those markers below the threshold, but if they are on space 26 during the preparation phase, then the game is over or can be over. There is also the condition of overwhelming hunger and this occurs during the hunger phase of the game. If your hunger level, so the lowest track on the population board, reaches 25 after spending food to decrease hunger. So this red marker, which is currently on zero, reaches the last space on the population track after you've spent some food to reduce this value. And also overwhelming deaths. This occurs when the corpse marker, so the one on the supply board over here, moves to the last space on the corpse track which is number 10. And you can see some red skull icons on different game pieces on the board, and this symbolizes the various components as a reminder of these loose conditions for the game. Now, before we go into gameplay, there is one thing that we need to also talk about on the hope and discontent board, because this is a mechanic that requires just a slight clarification. Let me zoom us in on this board right now, and I will remind you that during the setup we've placed two discontent and two hope markers, and two hope markers had to be with the active side up and the discontent markers, one was active and one was inactive. So we've got three types of these markers. For hope, we have care, justice, and motivation. And this is a care marker and this is a justice marker as an example over here. And for discontent, we have anger, we have greed and we have apathy symbolized by three dots. At some point, the game might ask you to activate or exhaust tokens. So whenever you are instructed to activate a token, you flip one of the inactive tokens to the active side if you have one on the track. And whenever you need to exhaust a token, you flip an active one if you have it on the track to the inactive side. And if you cannot, because you don't have any inactive tokens to flip to the active side or vice versa, you ignore the game effect. So in other words, if you are required to exhaust a token to resolve an effect, you can only resolve that effect if you are able to exhaust or activate a token. So the other topic is increasing and decreasing of hope and discontent. So whenever the game asks you to increase hope or discontent, 
and they don't specify on the component, whether it's a card or anything else, which type of hope or discontent token you need to increase, you must choose one of the two things. You either draw a random token from the bag and add it exhausted side up to the leftmost empty space, or you activate any one inactive token that you have on the corresponding track. So it's either or one of those options. However, whenever the game asks you to increase your hope or discontent of a specific type, you have to perform the two steps that I will tell you right now in the exact order. You draw a random token from the appropriate bag, so the appropriate type, and place it exhausted side up on the leftmost empty space of the track. And if possible, you activate one of the exhausted tokens of the indicated type. So you have to fill both of those points if possible. And each time you decrease hope or discontent, you must choose one of the two following options. You either exhaust one of the active tokens of the corresponding track, or you remove any one exhausted token on the corresponding track and place it back into the bag, and you slide the rest to the left. So right now, I think it's safe to talk about the gameplay and all the details here. So a normal turn in gameplay in Frostpunk consists of nine phases, if you believe it or not. Now, during the first turn, after you set up the game, you start with phase six. And I will mention that to you once we get to phase six, but I will be discussing everything chronologically from the first phase. But remember, the first round of the game skips the first five phases. First, it will be the dawn phase when the leader token is passed and the round marker on the round board is moved to the higher number and if it covers any token that was placed on the board, the effect is being resolved. Usually, those tokens will be of three kinds, and those are the most popular ones. The blue storm token, if the marker reaches it, you resolve the storm card that is assigned to the scenario. If the green token marking the scenario trigger is reached, you resolve the corresponding entry on the scenario card. And sometimes a technology development token will be reached. And if this happens, you remove this token from the board, you place it active side up on one of the four technology cards that you have next to your board, which doesn't have a technology development marker on it, and then you take one of the inactive tokens and place it a number of days shown on the technology card you've taken it from away from the marker. So let's hypothesize for a second. Let's say that I had a technology development marker over here, and in the beginning of the dawn phase, I moved onto this space. I take this marker off of the board, I look for a technology card which doesn't have a technology marker on it, which is this one, I don't know if you can see it on the screen right now, the first one here, and then I look at other cards, I choose the technology which we want to design next, I take the inactive token from it, this card tells me that I need to place it four turns further, so I count one, two, three, four, and place this token here, and once this marker reaches this token, I will take it off, place it on this technology active side up, and I will choose a new technology to develop. This is how our settlement's technological tree is being grown. Next, we have the morning phase. In the morning phase, we reveal a morning card from the same board as we had in the previous round, and we resolve the text on the card. And those cards may have instant effects which are resolved immediately. They can also have some numbered options. If they have numbered options, we have to choose one of those that is possible for us to resolve before, because we can pay the price of this effect and then do it. And sometimes those cards can have one of the two symbols. Sometimes there is a symbol of an X 
X-crossed card, like on this Storm card, which means that after resolving this effect, the card is being removed from the game and placed back in the box, while sometimes there will be a card with an exclamation mark symbol on it, which means that this card is placed in the event display next to the game board, and this effect is an ongoing one. The third phase is the generator phase, which happens on this generator board here and is concerning our gigantic tower in the middle of the room, let's say. And this one is very important as well. So at the start of the phase, you may fuel the generator to increase the amount of heat produced. So you may spend any number of coal from your resources over here and move them into the bank in order to fuel the generator. And then you add advance the heat marker up this track. The only thing is that the heat marker can never cross this cold marker over here. It may move onto it, but never higher. After heating the generator, after fueling the generator, you need to check how many citizens become sick because of the cold, so the difference in positions between these two markers. So hypothetically, if I had a heat of one, two, three right now, I would see that one of my engineers and one of my workers will get sick and I move the corresponding markers on the round track one space up for each of those symbols. If a sickness marker would reach the space beyond a corresponding citizen marker by doing this, then instead of moving this sickness marker further than my citizen marker, I would flip it to its other side, which represents a skull. The significance of the skull and flipping this marker will be discussed later on. Next, in the generator phase, I check the generator stress level. I take the number of coal cubes associated with the stress number next to my current heat level, and I throw those cubes through the top of the generator. After the cubes have fallen, I pull out the drawer and see how many cubes are there in the drawer, and I place them here on this stress track, which has 10 spaces. If all the 10 spaces are filled in this way, and I still have to place some additional cubes, they are placed in the overflow space on the top of the track, and this means that the generator breaks down. And whether the generator broke down or not, you always reset the heat marker during this generator round, and you move it back to the lowest space of the heat track. And what happens if the generator breaks down? For the first time, you flip the heat marker to the exploded or overheated side, so that to remember that it's happened already once, because if it happens for the second time, game over, right? And you return all of the stress cubes from the stress track, including those in the overflow spaces, back to the bank. You also advance the cold marker one step higher, and you also do the same with all three tokens on this heat track range. And now we go into the fourth phase, which is the weather phase. And during the weather phase, you draw the first top card from the weather deck next to the generator board, and you will find out a few things from this. You'll find out how many spaces do the heat range indicators move. You will find out about hunter traps if you have any. You will find out about expedition progress and you will find out about the storm marker movement. So let's talk about those one by one. As you can see on this card, I have the cold marker and the yellow heat marker with a number of one, which means that I move the cold marker one space up and the yellow heat range marker by one space up. And that's basically it. The hunter trap symbol means that I would, in this case, gain one food from each hunter's hut that has a green hunter symbol on it. So for example, if I had an upgraded hunter's hut that has two of those symbols and one not upgraded with one green hunting symbol, I would get free food in this case. Then expedition progress is the third information on the weather card, and I advance each of my scouts the indicated number of spaces forward on the respective expedition stack. And we'll talk about the expeditions a bit later, but we have these fields here, and we move the exact number of fields shown here if we can. And the fourth piece of information is that the storm 
is coming closer and we are moving the blue storm marker backwards on the turn track closer to us by this amount. And after this, we discard this card. In phase number five, we are in the preparation phase. So at the start of the preparation phase, the players collectively can choose the advisor which will be used in the round. And you may only use one advisor in a round, but you can use the same one over the course of the next consecutive rounds. And the final decision is to the player with the leadership token if you can't agree on anything. And immediately after an advisor has been chosen, the ability of that advisor may be used by exhausting the indicated hope token. So as you can see, for example, on this card, you have an information that during the preparation phase, only when you use up a motivation token, you can conduct this action. And each of those advisors has a different action. All of those cards are two-sided, but they're identical on both sides, only the gender is different. And after you resolve your advisor, you also resolve the sickness. And this is the time where you check whether any of your sickness markers is on space 26 or higher, and if it is, you lose the game. Otherwise, if you don't lose the game just yet, you resolve each sickness marker on the population track from the lowest to the highest. And I will show you this on the example of the workers. So let's say that my current situation for my workers after a few rounds is that I have workers on 22. So I have five worker meeples in my pool and I have the sickness marker on 15 over here. And you resolve the effects here below the track, which means that you place the indicated number of spent citizen tokens of the corresponding type in your supply. So this would mean that I would have to place two spent worker tokens, because this is the yellow sickness marker, into my pool of workers over here and place two worker meeples on those tokens. This means that those meeples cannot be used during this turn. And if I don't have enough meeples to place one on each token, the tokens that were left empty will be there for the next round and my meeples will be unavailable for longer. The second symbol means that you flip the sickness marker to the other side a number of times. So in this case, two. So this is right now on the syringe side. And if I flip it to the other side, there is a skull icon here and it doesn't mean anything, but this instructs me that I need to flip this token once more. So whenever this token with the syringe is flipped from the skull side back onto the syringe side, that means that a member of this population died, which means that I move this death marker track along here. And remember that 10 means that you end the game. And because one person died, you move back the syringe and you move back the population marker. Well, because there's a dead person, you lost the worker. So that's it for the preparation phase. And then we get to phase six, which is the biggest phase of the game and where a lot of things happen. And this is the action phase. And at the start of the action phase, you need to check that you have an appropriate number of meeples here on your board in respect to what you have over there on the population track, because sicknesses might have reduced this number or something like that. And if you have any spent tokens, you also have to be sure that there are meeples on them if you can and place them there. And then we, in player turns, beginning with the player with the leadership marker and going clockwise, each player takes a turn and play continues in this way until you run out of available meeples in your space or you don't want to take any more actions. And on your turn, you may first, before you commit to any action, choose to fuel the generator so spend coal from your resources into the bank in order to increase the heat marker up on the track. And this does not result in the generator breaking down. This is only checked in the generator phase. So here you can increase the heat safely, 
but any increase that you do right now will be left for the generator phase. So it might get dangerous later on. And you have a few actions that you can perform within the action phase. This is removing snow, gathering resources, constructing, using a building, deploying scouts, and performing a special action from an event or a scenario card. A lot of those actions will be referring to one concept. This is whether the action is taking in heated or cold conditions. Now, this is reflected by these heated tokens. And the heat token here has to be above a symbol on this heated track in order for any condition to be fulfilled. And this is an either or. So buildings, as you can see here on the building board, usually have a yellow, orange, or red insulation. If the building has a white insulation, then it doesn't take part in the mechanic of heated or unheated actions, or it has some special conditions. But talking about the yellow, orange, and red, if the heat marker is above the red, orange, or yellow marker, that means that the actions taken in that building with that color of insulation are heated. And if the heat marker is below that color, that means that those actions are taken in the cold. And the second condition is the distance from the generator. So if the marker is above only this first symbol, that means that heated conditions are everywhere on the tile surrounding the generator itself. So no matter the insulation level, this whole area is heated. If the marker is above this symbol, that means that the ring of first hexes around the generator tile is also heated regardless of the insulation. And this one means that the whole board of hexes, even the further ones, are heated. So to be clear, one of those two conditions has to be met in order to identify whether the action is heated or not. So so a building might be here and your marker might be here. So below this symbol that says that the outer circle of hexes is heated. But if the building has a red insulation or orange, then your marker over here would mean that those insulations also provide heating. So remember, one of two conditions. That's very important for the game because the consequence of doing the actions in the cold or in the heat are very clear. If you perform an action in heated conditions, nothing happens. If, however, you perform an action in cold conditions, you have to advance the sickness marker of that type of citizen one space up. And also important is that constructing, deploying scouts and special actions are always heated, no matter what. And removing snow is always done in the cold. And gathering resources or using a building can be either heated or cold. And this is where this track is being resolved usually. So let's talk about those six actions. First, removing snow. Remember, always in the cold. So you always, selecting the meeple that will be removing the snow, you place this meeple over here, because this is the space for the snow removal action, and this sickness marker from that meeple will be increased, and you can't use children for labor until a special law is passed. So children are just there for being children right now. So you place an available meeple on the remove snow space, you increase the sickness because this is always done in cold, and you either place two near tiles, which do not have to be adjacent to each other, from the top of the near stack onto the board, face up, and you obviously populate them with resources after you uncover them, or you place one far tile from the top of the far deck, and you also populate it with resources. And the only requirement here is that near tiles have to be placed adjacent to the generator tile, and the far tiles have to be placed adjacent to a near tile which is connected to the generator. So you wouldn't be able to place a far tile here right now. It would have to be here or here or here or here or on the other side over there. 
The second action is gathering resources. And gathering resources, depending on which tile you are doing it from, can be heated or in cold, depending on where your heat marker is on the track. And this means that you send your meeple out to a hex and you collect the resources and place them in your resource pool. You can take up to two resources from a space. And to be clear, a space is one of the two halves of the hex. So if you send your meeple here, you don't take one and one, for example. So those spaces are separate. This means that each hex, apart from the ones surrounding the generator, is divided into two, and you have to decide where to go. But two consecutive gathering resource actions can be sent to the same hex to empty it of the resource. Then we have the construct action, which has a space over here to place the meeples that were used for this action. And this action allows you to construct or dismantle buildings. And you can do it up to three times using one action. So you can construct two times or dismantle one time, or you can construct once or dis and dismantle two times. You can mix it up. When building, you have to decide which building from the building board will you take and pay the cost that's associated with the corresponding column in the white. One wood, two wood, three wood, four wood, and a steam core, five wood and a steam core, and here we've got a cost in wood as well. You place the building on a space on the map that does not contain a meeple or another building. And if you place a building on a space with resources or trees, you return those to the bank. So it's risky to place buildings where you have resources uncollected because, well, you will lose the chance to collect those. And as with collecting resource, small buildings are placed on one half of the hex, which means that two buildings can be in one hex, whereas those big buildings are placed on the entire hex. And here around the generator, you have space for one, two, three, four buildings because you already have a kitchen over there and you can't place any buildings here. This is where the drawer is being slid out. Now, some buildings will have some limitations. For example, this observation balloon has this red house icon, which says that this building cannot be dismantled. Some buildings can have an icon saying that this building cannot be built, but can be put on the board using different actions, maybe some laws or maybe some scenario rules. And remember that you place the buildings with the non-upgraded side up, because on the reverse side, there is very often an upgrade. Dismantling buildings on the other side is very easy. You choose a building on the map where there are no meeples on it, and you place it back on the building board, and that's it. And if you dismantle a ruins space, then you put those ruins back into the box. Ruins usually appear as effects of the storms. And then the next action is using a building, and this is also heated or in the cold, depending on the insulation of a building or the distance of the building from the generator. So you have to verify and check this. And some buildings will have a limitation that, for example, if you have an engineer symbol here in the lower left corner, that means that this building can be used only if you send an engineer meeple to that building. And the effects of those buildings are explained in the rule books pretty well, so I won't be getting into those. But remember that each building can be triggered only once by one meeple per turn. And larger buildings, because they occupy two spaces on the board, can be activated twice by one meeple on the lower half and one meeple on the upper half of the building. The next action that you can do is deploying scouts. For this action, you have to have the beacon, as it's called in the English rulebook, built. If you don't have it built yet, you can't use this action completely. And this action is always heated. So when you have, I will lift it once again, the unupgraded beacon built, you can upkeep one expedition at a time, so only one of those three stacks of cards will be occupied and expeditions will travel on this. On an upgraded version, you'll be able to upkeep two expeditions at a time. And this means that you choose the meeple and the chosen meeple is moved onto the first space of a chosen expedition card and it stays there, whether it's a worker meeple or an engineer meeple. And remember that those meeples will move on those cards 
based on the next drawn weather card from the weather stack during the weather phase. And special actions are described usually on the side of scenario cards or event cards and are described and triggered accordingly. You will have to pay some costs usually and you can trigger those actions only if you pay that cost. So then comes the seventh phase, which is the dusk phase, and we're getting close to the end. And during this dusk phase, you take the card of the dusk phase that you've placed face down in the beginning of the game, you shuffle the two cards together and you see which ones you will draw. If it's a social dispute card, you resolve it. And if it has this recycle symbol, instead of putting it back in the box, you place it on the discard pile on the dusk board. If, however, you drew the inevitable card from the dusk pile, you basically resolve all of the effects and you place the card back into the middle slot. After resolving the social dispute card from the dusk deck, if the card didn't have a recycle symbol, like I showed you earlier, which would mean that it goes into the discard pile, you remove this card into the box and then you shuffle back all the discarded cards from the Dusk deck together with the inevitable card and a new social dispute card from the face-up ones and you create a new Dusk deck as such. And finally, the one but last phase, which is the hunger phase. First, you decrease the previous hunger in this phase and at the start of this phase, if your hunger level, so the red token, is one or more, you must spend food to decrease hunger levels as much as you are able. For each food spent, so lowering the yellow marker, you will lower the hunger level by one. And after you spend your food to lower the hunger, you check the effects of your hunger level. If the hunger in this way is still above 25 or on 25, you lose the game. However, if it's between one and 24, so you didn't manage to reduce it to zero, you have to increase discontent, which is shown by this fist icon on the track of hunger on the population board. And we were talking about how we increase discontent already. And sometimes you will have a number next to a skull icon, which will mean that a number of citizens dies, which will increase the death track here above the supply board. The type of citizens that die is determined by the icon above the previous round on the round track. So let me zoom in. If my current round was round three and I had to kill two citizens due to hunger, I would be killing engineers because though this is the marker from above the previous round. After resolving the effects of hunger, you move the hunger marker back to the position zero on the food track, obviously, because hunger will be growing every single time from zero. And next, you must feed your citizens by spending one food for each citizen you have of the indicated type by the current round. And the position of the citizen marker is important here as well. So if you do not have enough food, you add one hunger level for each of that lack. And if the hunger level increases to more than 25, you flip the marker to the 25 plus side and it starts back from the beginning of the track. So in this case, 25 does not mean the end of the game. 25 means the end of the game only when you check for hunger after decreasing previous hunger. So if you've already checked for decreasing previous hunger and your citizens died and your discontent grew, then in round three, I would have to feed my workers. So I go and check on my population board that I have 22 workers, and that means that I would have to spend food. And for each citizen that I cannot feed in this way, so if I have less food, I would have to increase hunger by one, and this would mean that in the consecutive round, I would start with a hunger level when I would be doing the hunger check.
And then finally, there is the ninth and last phase, which is the night phase. And in the night phase, you remove all of your spent citizen tokens, which means the ones that have meeples on them into your, and the ones without meeples will remain there for the future round. You return all of the meeples placed this round everywhere on the map or here on the spaces for uh, clearing the snow or construction into your supplies right now, and also from any event or scenario cards, you may choose to fuel the generator if required to heat your shelters for the night. You count the number of available sleeping slots in heated shelters, and let me take a look, show you the shelters. Shelters are, for example, buildings like this with those icons over here. And if this is a heated shelter, it can house two meeples. And for each meeple in your supply that is still standing, so has nowhere warm to sleep, so you can't assign them to any heated shelter, you will gain one sick citizen of the matching type. And now, after those nine phases, I will only mention a few other things that happen during the game that we didn't mention over the course of the game. And the first is that when citizens die, you not only increase this level on the death track here, when it goes to 10, you end the game, but you also draw one card from the citizen deck and you discard it after resolving the appropriate effect, depending on what type of citizen died. And those effects are described here on the bottom. And instead of drawing a citizen card from the deck, any player may discard a citizen card matching that type of citizen that died, and if they do, you apply the death effect of the discarded card. So it will be a more conscious choice instead of a completely random one. Now, you can also cure and treat citizens. Various game effects, some buildings and some actions with a cross icon can cure citizens. And this means that each cure point can allow you to move any one sickness marker one space to the left. And then there is treatment. Treatment is a skull icon with an arrow pointing down. And this means that you can flip the skull on the sickness tokens back to the syringe site without triggering the death of a citizen. If you can do it two times, you can flip two different tokens in this way from the skull to the syringe side. So that can be very helpful. The citizen cards, apart from their type, they have their starting cost, their name, we mentioned that, they have the death effect, and they have a use effect. And you can use those citizens that you have in your hand, and remember that you start the game with a few citizens in your hand, for this main ability, when you are performing an action related to the one described here, whether it's an action related to a building or something else. And when you do it, before placing the meeple, you can play the citizen card in order to trigger the effect. And only one citizen card can be played for each action, and each player may only play one citizen card for its main ability each round. And after resolving this card, you leave it in front of you as a reminder, and then you place it on the discard pile. Now, I've told you about starting the expedition and that you need a beacon and that you need to perform the action there to do it. I told you also about the movement along the expedition track, which is defined by the weather card. And now I need to tell you what happens when the expedition reaches the end of a card. All of the cards in the corner have a symbol with some information about what rewards you can expect on each of those cards. And once an expedition reaches the last space on a card, the players must choose whether they want to skip this location or explore it. And if you skip the location on an A or B expedition, you draw an expedition from the next deck. So if you skip an A location, you draw a card from the B location. And if you skip a B location, you draw from C. You place the card so that it covers most of the previous expedition card. So for example, like this, leaving only the first space of the previous expedition card visible. And then you place the scout on the first bottommost space of the new expedition 
edition card like this. And if you had any remaining movement left over from the weather card, you may still continue. If you, however, decide to explore the location, you place the scout next to the topmost expedition card in the expedition stack and you flip this card over to its back side and you do not flip any other cards that would be under it. And then you have usually two choices. Either this choice with an arrow pointing to the right, which means to continue the expedition. So you leave the expedition card on the black side up and you take a new expedition from the corresponding deck and the number of the deck is always below the icon and you cover it so that you can see only this effect and then you continue the expedition over here, or you decide to return to the city, which is this yellow arrow pointing left. And this means that you will gain the resources that are here and on all the cards that were turned with the black side up from the expeditions that you decided to continue. So for example, if I had a stack like this and I reached the final space of my expedition right now, I would flip this card and I would decide that I want to go back to the city, which would give me those rewards, but also these rewards right now. And with this, there is also a rule. If the new card for a new expedition when you are returning to the city is shown as card A, you just add it as an A card to the new stack and you start a new expedition from a card A. But if it's a B or C, then you should take a corresponding card from the B or C stack. You flip all the cards in this expedition stack back to the white side like so and you add the new card on the top and you place this stack as a new expedition so those expeditions can be longer. Now, the next thing that hasn't been explained yet are the law cards, which are over here, and those are pretty straightforward. There are two stacks of cards, law cards and the consequence cards right next to them. And you may look through the law cards at any time, but not the consequence cards. No, no, no. And there is a building called a platform, which is placed permanently next to the generator, which allows you to introduce a new law. And when you do this, you choose any law card from the future laws that you have in the pile and you place it along the edge of the map as a new law. And then you take the two law consequence cards with the same identification number as the law card and you choose one at random and you shuffle it into the dusk deck. So it might be drawn and might be triggered as a consequence of this law. And last but not least, technology cards. Now, when you build your first workshop, which is this building, you are allowed to choose one of your technology cards from the display and place its development token on the round track, as I've explained, a number of days, a number of rounds away from the marker. And this will trigger your technology advancements. Everything else in this game, guys, it's either explained in the rulebook and connected to an effect of a building or an effect of a card, and there are a lot of clarifications in the rulebook that will definitely help you. I'm sorry if this was or got a bit convoluted at some times. This game has so many rules and so many things to remember about that I definitely have skipped or misordered something, but I tried to explain and clarify it as much as possible, but now I am done. For now, this was me. My name was Lone Vic. This was Frostpunk, the board game. I hope this video helped you in any way and I hope that you found it okay and you liked my explanation. If you did, what I can ask of you is to help me grow my channel and support it by clicking the like button, hitting the subscribe and ringing the notification bell to be notified about new videos coming to my channel regularly. And also, if you feel up to it and you feel like it, you can find a link in the description to this video and all the others on my channel where you can buy me a cup of coffee. And for now, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. My name is Lone Vic. This was Frostpunk, the board game. One of the longest videos on my channel, if not the longest single video. Sorry for the length. And right now I'm cutting it short. So very quick goodbyes, have a great day, see you soon, bye bye.